Is your house cold and drafty in the winter? Would you like to do something about it, but you don't know where to start? Are you afraid some contractor will sell you a bill of goods and take your money? Hi, I'm Wes Gollum, the energy geek and author of Warm and Cool Homes, building a comfy, healthy, net zero home you'll want to live in forever. If this sounds like you, whether you're a do-it-yourselfer or someone who just wants to be informed before they hire a contractor, I think you'll find this video interesting. My friend, award-winning net zero home builder Bob Irving is going to show us a systematic plan for cost-effectively doing a deep energy retrofit and cutting your energy costs forever. I'm Wes Gollum, the Energy Geek. And I'm here today with Bob Irving, Bob the Builder, who is an award-winning Net Zero home builder from New Hampshire. And today, let's talk about uh, uh, retrofits. First of all, hi, Bob. How are you tonight? I'm good. How are you, Wes? I'm good. Thanks for being on. Um, so, as you know, as you were part of, I wrote this book on Net Zero Homes, and uh, the real interest I'm finding from most people, logically, is that they're interested in retrofits, not just in what you can do in a new home. So I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about retrofits, if that's okay. Let's start with the general question. Would you please talk a little bit about the similarities and dissimilar aspects of building or retrofitting a home to be a net zero or high performance? Yeah, um, glad to. Uh, the, uh, they both relate the same way to the passive house principles, which is what I always go back to. I took, uh, I studied passive house in 2009 and I'd been building for over 35 years and I probably learned more in that class than I did in the previous 35 years. It was all about physics and how houses work in the real world, how heat behaves, how moisture behaves, how air in the house behaves, uh, and how you build the house or retrofit a house to take advantage of physics. Simply a matter of the, the, the key goal in, in all cases is to keep the heat you make inside the house. Sounds pretty basic, but um, most people burn enough fuel of whatever kind to heat a house four times, five times their size, but it all leaks out and they got to keep charging the wood stove uh, or whatever it is. Uh, the real, so the, the challenge is how do you keep the heat inside the house? Uh, while maintaining comfort in the house, while maintaining a reasonable uh, moisture level in the house so it isn't too dry or too damp or, or whatever. You don't want mold growing. You don't want your skin cracking because it's so dry and you don't want mold growing because it's too damp. Uh, and we've had all of those things happen in our house in the past. It was too dry at times. It was too damp at times. Uh, we had mold growing on the living room wall 10, 15 years ago. What Passive House says is the first thing you do is look at the house as an envelope. Think of it as a, uh, I have a picnic cooler, a foam picnic cooler, and the cover snaps shut. Uh, it's, all, it's all solid. And I have a larger cooler uh, that we take camping, and that's all foam. And you close the top, and it's surrounded by foam. Uh, and it's relatively, I mean, it's not airtight, but it's relatively tight. Uh, and that both of those things keep things fairly cold for quite a long time because they're surrounded by insulation. There's no thermal bridging. And you're dealing with everything in the environment. The envelope theory is that every part of the house that you use is part of the envelope. And what most people don't realize is that that includes the basement, if there is a basement. Because in virtually every situation, the basement is used. It may be not be an area that, you know, you may have to wear your coat. Uh, it may not be an area you, uh, you know, you may not you have your best rugs of furniture down there, but it is used. And the point is that if it's a space you use, it needs to be within the envelope. And even uh, when it's not used, it's often been treated as 
it's it's not part of the envelope. It's either inside the envelope or outside the envelope. When I was doing codes, we were telling people it was okay to insulate the ceiling of the basement when they had regular doors between the basement and the first floor, and they had all kinds of other connections, holes. Holes yeah. and pipes and everything else. Right, like exactly, the, exactly. The but so that really, even though we... We treated it, or we told them to treat it like it was the That's basement it. was outside the envelope. It really never was, even though that's perfectly legit from a code point of view. Well, it's legit from a code point of view, but that's about it. Um, I understand that. Windows are by no means the first thing you should be looking at in a retrofit. If you've got single-pane windows, I would take exception to that, perhaps, and... If you've got windows that specifically need replacing for one reason or another, but generally the things that Bob is talking about make absolute economic and logical sense. What's the biggest difference between trying to make an old house energy efficient and a new house? The main difference is that it's harder because all your walls are done Everything is finished in, in your house. So uh, if there are leaks inside the walls, you're not going to get to them probably. So it's, it's harder to make it very good. But by the same token, it's usually not that difficult to do a pretty good job. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I've been at houses where you can feel the air coming up next to the baseboard, for instance. Get a tube of caulking. A little bit of caulking in that crack, and that'll stop the air from coming in. Things like that make a huge difference. The first thing I would do is get a blower door test. Get an energy auditor over there, and you want to know the number. How many air changes an hour? You don't want to know that it's just not very good or lousy, or you need a new furnace, or you need a new more insulation in the attic. The situation right then, at that point, what you want, is a number. You want to know how leaky the house is. You and you know, I think a good analogy to this is think about how you would start on a diet if you wanted to lose weight. You wouldn't just get on a scale and have some general figure, no pun intended. You would uh, get a specific number and maybe you have a goal or maybe you want to compare along the way. But either way, that's what Bob is really saying here. Yeah, you need to have something to understand what you're doing and, and how to get there. There's so, another piece to the puzzle you can get from that lower door test, even if the house is finished. When you have an auditor there doing a blower door test, you know, obviously you want to find where the air leaks are. But another thing he's likely able to do is he probably has some spreadsheets or some programs that'll help you to analyze what's the most cost-effective thing for you to do and so you could start it. If you don't want to do everything all at once, you can look at what's the most cost-effective and start that, which is probably sealing air leaks, which is Always usually helpful. the most cost-effective thing you can do in a house and also right. usually one of the least expensive things you might do. So, yeah. I, uh, the other thing I want to say uh, when we talk, while we talk about energy auditor, your best bet is to find somebody that's just an energy auditor and, and not a company selling something. Um, I know I'm going to get uh, nasty calls from people selling stuff that are energy auditors. No, some of them are very, some are of them very, are very good, good and they're honest. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them are like that. Um, other, other people want to sell you stuff. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story here. I, back when I was a baby energy auditor, I went to work for a company called Energy Shield. I've heard them advertised recently, and I'm not sure if it's actually the same company as back then. But they, um, they wanted me to get an energy auditor certification, which I did. Turned out I was the second person in the state to get it. Energy Shield wanted me to go do audits but they had they wanted me to do they wanted to sell exterior storm windows which aren't a bad product at all and insulation that was then you know you could have done a sideline working for uh you know electrolux selling vacuum cleaners 
or Kirby. I guess it's Kirby yeah. that does the door to door stuff. So, yeah. one size fits all. You one can, size you fits all. Exactly right. Listen. You can get a lot of benefits by working with the utilities in New Hampshire. Uh, we can get some benefits, including a less expensive audit. I believe if you go through New Hampshire Saves, it's a hundred dollars, and then you get that money refunded if you do the work and that also opens you up to their incentives and for many of the things you might want to do if you're an eligible customer and there's some questions about what eligibility you can save some money through the new hampshire save incentive that said i don't know what their audits are geared towards now they used to be geared towards specifically saving on electricity and therefore they weren't as interested in some of the energy efficiency things if you were heating with oil for example now that may be way out of date that was once upon a time there is an organization in new hampshire called the residential energy performance association repa and they are independent energy auditors some of them do work with the utilities, but they're consultants. Some of them may also, as Bob was saying, sell something, but you can ask them. But there's a list of the members of REPA on their website. And if you're that's looking for an energy auditor, I think that that's a, uh, good, that's place. a good place. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, the point is you would like somebody who's going to give you the straight poop about the building science in your house, not, you know, a preordained, uh, I'm going to sell you windows and insulation. Yeah. And I just want to be clear that it's not that you might not need windows at some point. Maybe you need more insulation in your attic. But I think if you're serious about fixing up your house, it's good to go about it in a more of an organized method. If you need to add insulation, you may want to air seal your attic, for instance, before you put more insulation in. So that's why I'm saying don't jump into this. Don't have somebody come in and dump a whole lot of insulation in in a place that's not air sealed that you're going to have to move it later if you want to, if you want to fix the house. So if there's a lot of leaks into the attic and you've got insulation on the floor of the attic, you need to stop the air going up into the attic. But the easiest way to do it in an existing house, if you have that situation, is to do it from above. Go up in the attic, pull out the bats of fiberglass, if that's what they are, or uh, an insulator can come in and, and vacuum up or rake up the, uh, the cellulose insulation and then vacuum it and then spray foam the whole ceiling. We've talked about air sealing. We've talked about the envelope and sort of about insulation, blower door test. Um, somebody who's just getting going on a project like this, what else do they need to know? I think the thing to understand is is really what the goals are, what you're looking for, what what is the problem, and what is a you know what's the solution to the problem, and it's hard to find out because these factors in making a good house are it's only been in the last. 15 years that we've been talking about these specific things in the United States. What Passive House uh, has a lot of things in common with some other recommendations, for instance, from the building science uh, company in Boston. They made some building recommendations. Science Corporation. You know, how, what you should do where in a house. But what Passive House does is put it all together. It's why you're doing it. And and that's the, that's the key to this thing, is why you're doing it, what benefit you get from each part of it, and what, why you need to do that. And I I think that's the thing to wrap your head around. You're not looking for what, what latest gizmo to spray on something or stuff in your walls or whatever. It's not about gizmos. It's not about brand names. It's about fixing the problems that you already have and making it a better house. And anybody can do that. You may not get to passive house levels. I've got a house started out in the 1700s. That part burned down, but then this, the part that's here started, uh, was built in the 1800s. Uh, and it's been added on to a number of times, um, several by me. And, and it's a hodgepodge of everything. Um, but it, it doesn't matter. You know, I've, I've done, uh, I've fixed up some things with uh, um, bubble gum and tape and, and uh, 
you know what I had, what what I had that I could use, and did some things that needed to be done. And some of those things took took time. And I I I have a I had a dirt floor in my basement for years. It wasn't use a usable basement. It was a dirt floor. I decided at some point I needed to insulate the floor, and I wanted a concrete pour concrete on top of that because it was going to be usable space. I had to dig down because it was very little headroom. So I had to dig down several inches to get enough headroom to put in the insulation and the, and the wood and that kind of thing, I mean, and the concrete. So this was a lot of work, a lot of wheelbarrows full of dirt, a lot of uh, buckets I carried out of this place. Uh, but in the end, I have a place that stays in the mid 50s and with moderate humidity all all year long. It's a little gets in the 60s in the in the summer, but it's it's always comfortable down here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's so it was so worth it. I have another 1,500 square feet of space. It's a workshop and it's storage and it's mm -hmm. it's wonderful space. So I think you really bring up uh, an several important points, but I'd like to focus on one. You know, when you build a brand new house, you're getting air changes down less than one air change per hour. And that's great for a brand new house. You're getting down near like half an air change in an hour, an hour right. which right. is fantastic. The code is like... And it's not change. that difficult. That's the key to remember. But for somebody retrofitting a house it's another story and you can bring your house yeah. and you this comes back to our um original idea that you want to get the lower door number when it's done how many air changes per hour because as you work or when you think you're finished you get another blower door test and you see how you did and it's not, let me just say here that that's, it's not a contest, but the house feels better at, if if it was 15 air changes an hour and now it's six, you can probably feel the difference. Probably a room doesn't cool off as fast. Probably you're not as, the house isn't as drafty. You can feel these things. You can feel the changes you're making and it will make real differences in your life. And this could be done over time. We both right. have been working on our houses for many years. Yeah. And we're and longer we're, we're, than I've been alive. <laughs> well, maybe. Well, hardly yeah. ever, but. Well. So this has been fun. I'm the energy geek. I'm Bob the Builder. And if we don't see you in the future, we'll see you in the pasture. Hi, this is Wes Gollum, the energy geek. I hope you found this video helpful and interesting. If you did, I would appreciate it if you would like it and subscribe to the Energy Geek channel. Please leave your comments below and thanks for watching.